Alrighty, welcome ladies and gentlemen, and we're going to start World War II during this vlogcast. So we got to know the road to war from 1919 to 1939. Quickly, again, we had the Versailles Treaty, the Treaty of Versailles. We had a very weak League of Nations, the fact that the Japanese actually just walked right out of the League. And it was very ineffective. No control, no progress, no effective military force. And of course, German soldiers are dissatisfied. As you can see in the picture here, that's Hitler during World War I. Now, France puts up a false sense of security. They put through the Maginot Line. Now, the Maginot Line is a line of defenses along the French border with Germany. It's just as you see in the picture there, a lot of little machine gun nests. So if Germany ever tried to invade France again, they would be ready to attack and defend. But it, as you can tell, it's kind of a false sense of security. And as you can see, just like in the previous war, they went through Belgium. Again, the Schlieffen plan. They went through Belgium, they didn't even go anywhere near the Marginal Line. Okay? The Great Depression hits, hits Germany really hard. We have a couple different crises before this, including the Manchurian Crisis, where Japan invades Manchuria, China. Okay? Italy attacks Ethiopia in 1935 to get back again at during imperialism when Menelik II had actually kicked out the Italians. Germany in, ends up invading the Rhineland, that's the land between Germany and France. And they were not supposed to militarize the Rhineland on the Rhine River, however they did. And this goes against the Treaty of Versailles. This is all adding up to something. And now the U.S. Proclaims neutrality. They want nothing to do with what's going on in Europe. And during this time, the Spanish are going through their own civil war um, with their leader, Franco, Francisco Franco. And sure enough, he does win that war. And it does sort of become a dress rehearsal for World War II. Now, we have a problem with the Sudetenland. The Sudetenland is a land in Czechoslovakia where there are a lot of Germanic people. And Hitler believes in Anschluss, okay? Meaning that all of these Germanic people need to reunite, including Austria, including the Sudetenland. So Hitler goes and takes his army and takes it. However, the prime minister at the time of Britain Neville Chamberlain says we have peace in our time. He appeases Hitler during the Munich conference. He gives in to his demands in order to avoid a larger conflict. And when he does this, he gives Hitler, again, the Sudetenland. Says you can hold on to it as long as you don't go and invade anything else. Well, sure enough, he invades the rest of Czechoslovakia. And in 1939, it becomes part of the Third Reich. Again, part of Hitler's... Empire. And at the same time, he signs the Nazi Soviet Non Aggression Pact in 1939, saying that Stalin and Hitler agree not to attack each other. We knew this wasn't going to last, but Hitler was very smart because if he had a very peaceful non aggression pact on the Eastern Front with the Russians, he could easily put all his forces on the Western Front and invade France and then later attack the Russians, and that's what's going to happen. So the war begins in on September 1st, 1939. Poland is attacked, and he does it through a new way of warfare called Blitzkrieg, where literally he's going to go and send the troops in, send the planes, send the planes first, drop all these bombs, weaken the troops, so then he can grow in with the tanks and a whole barrage of troops to then didn't annihilate. And it worked, and it was fast and efficient. And unfortunately, German troops end up marching right into Warsaw. And this is when we get the Rome-Berlin-Tokyo axis, or the axis altogether. And this is Mussolini of Italy, Hirohito of Japan, and Hitler of Germany. They're all working together. Meanwhile, we have different theaters, as they call it, going on. It's a world war. One is the Dunkirk. Dunkirk gets evacuated June 4th, 1940. All of a sudden, Hitler invades through France, through Belgium into France and engulfs France all the way to the point 
where they get stuck at one little place called Dunkirk. And he then stops his advance, and nobody knows why. But he stops it just in enough time for all of these people, we're talking fishermen, troops, everything, from England to cross the English Channel, grab up any civilians and troops that were over there, and put them back into a safe um, on Britain's soil so they could fight another day. And this is one of the biggest evacuations that have ever been in the fastest amount of time as well. And again, although they were defeated and France was completely German occupied, they could fight another day. France surrenders June 1940. The swastika waves above the Eiffel Tower. And sure enough, France gets divided. You have the German occupied France and then what they call Vichy France, which is actually controlled by a Frenchman, Henri Pétain, but at the same time, it's not at all um, French. It's still controlled by German forces. Now, the French resistance comes out of this, led by General Charles de Gaulle, where the free French forces are going to go ahead and, with spy tactics and bomb, they're going to, again, put a thorn in the side of the Germans and hopefully gain back their rightful land. But Britain's all alone now. It's just the British Bulldog holding the line. All the while, the U.S. Lend-Lease Act 1941, with Britain flat broke, the U.S. lends Britain arms and other supplies to the Allies. We're still neutral, but we still give them $48.6 billion of dollars through the Lend-Lease Act. Sure enough, the Battle of Britain occurs, the Blitz, where, and we all knew this was going to happen, Germany sends over their Luftwaffe, again, their Air Force, bombs London, bombs Britain, and everyone goes underground. We're talking nightly bombings, destroying Britain, and everyone huddles into the tube. These, the tube, their, their subway, turns into the air raid shelters during the Blitz. But the Royal Air Force, the RAF, they get in their planes, they get in the air, and they beat back the Germans. And when they do, it is their finest hour, as Church, Winston Churchill says, who is the British Prime Minister at this point. And he says very famous lines like, never was so much owed by so many to so few. He really supported what the RAF did. They did an amazing job beating back the Germans. Now, out of the battle, Britain come, comes so many different things. They get radar, the first secret weapon the British had against the Germans. They knew that the Germans were coming. They had sonar so they could see the German U-boats. Okay. Now Operation Barbarossa, Hitler's biggest mistake. He goes and he invades Russia. And when he invades the USSR, in, on June 22, 1941, he brings 3 million German soldiers, 3,400 tanks. And we're going to get back to that and see just how good he does on that front. Meanwhile, we have Pearl Harbor. This happens December 7, 1941. The Japanese attack the U.S. naval forces at Pearl Harbor. It was led by Admiral Yamamoto, and it was a huge, devastating defeat for the U.S. It's a date that will live in infamy, as the great FDR said. And we declare war on the U on Japan, and soon enough, Germany declares war on us the next day. The USS Arizona is a very nice memorial there for today, sank during the, the battle, including um, one of the biggest heroes, Dory Miller, who again grabbed one of the uh, machine guns, 50 cals, during the Pearl Harbor attack and shot down a couple ships, even though he was just a cook, an African-American cook in the Navy. Now, we mobilized for war. We put out the Selective Service Training and Service Act in order to get more people into the war, although we really didn't because a lot of people signed up voluntarily. We started selling war bonds to get some of these and rationing products to get money and food and supplies to these troops. And we started to hire women to take over traditionally male jobs. Again, we formed the big three. So now, Churchill isn't alone anymore. He's got Franklin Delano Roosevelt of the U.S., he's got Joseph Stalin of the USSR, and Winston Churchill, still of Great Britain. These guys are going up against the Axis. Now, the Battle of Stalingrad is the turning point. It's the winter of 1942 into 43, and all of a sudden, remember we talked about Operation Barbarossa, them going into the USSR in June, they didn't have their winter gear, and now they're stuck in a cold, cold Ru Russia. Now, the USSR's troops were actually 
pushing back and letting the Germans in and scorched and using scorched earth and killing any type of cattle that they could use, uh, making sure they couldn't take any ammo, any arsenals destroying those, and of course even burning crops, anything they couldn't use. And at Stalingrad, they finally put their feet down and stopped pushing the Germans back, and they do. It does take a while, but nevertheless, they do. They push them back, and it ends up being a battle of the snipers. And at the same time, we have the Battle of Al-Alamein, where we have General Ern Rommel, the Desert Fox, one of the most cunning uh, generals during the war for Germany against General Bernard Law Montgomery Monty. And what he does is he actually pushes Rommel back because Rommel was headed right to the Middle East for oil. Now, we have Operation Torch that goes on. Operation Torch, we go from that North Africa taking all of that back and start going, invading Sicily, and soon into Italy. We're taking Italy back. We're getting Europe back through the soft underbelly of the Italian campaign, led by George Patton. So we get Sicily. Again, George S. George C. Scott plays a great general pattern in the movie Patton. And we have the Battle of Monte Cassino, again a monastery on top of a hill that does get bombarded and eventually destroyed. It's rebuilt now. Um, but it is the turning point. And then we go straight into Rome. June 5th, 1944, the Allies liberate Rome, and now Italy is under the control of the Allies. Now Mussolini gets strung up in the square, him and his mistress, um, by the Italian people. Now Eisenhower gives the order for D-Day, Operation Overlord, the biggest disembarkation that's ever been attempted. And on June 6, 1944, we stormed the beaches of Normandy. And all the beaches were pretty easy landing, with the exception of Omaha Beach. Where we had some heavy resistance, but we pulled through. Now, July 20th, 1944, we have an assassination plot against Hitler that almost went off without a hitch due to Major Klaus von Stauffenberg with a bomb and a suitcase under the desk. Almost got him. Liberation of Paris occurs on August 25th, 1944. De Gaulle comes up in triumph. U.S. troops are in Paris. However, Hitler sends out his best. He doesn't want us to get into Germany because he has the Russians heading on one side. He has the U.S. and Britain and the other allies heading on the other side. We're closing in on Germany. He's got to think of a real quick plan. He sends out his SS, the best of the best that he has, during the Battle of the Bulge, his last offensive. And we almost get stuck in that. Now, in February 1945, we see that the war will be in our favor, so we go and we get the Conference of Yalta. We decide that we, we have to split up Germany between the USSR and us, um, and that Churchill wants a strong Germany as a buffer to Stalin, FDR wants the United Nations. Okay, U.S. and Russian soldiers meet at the Albi River, and of course, which is a whole new lesson, the Holocaust occurs during this time. And all I'm going to say is that it is a very horrible thing that ended up being exposed at the end of the war, showing the treatment of how the Germans treated the Jewish people. Six million dead, um, many deaths and concentration camps. It's very sad. Okay, and I'm going to end it on that note. All right, if you have any questions, let me know. Have a great rest of your day.